Thank you very much. And thank you to you and the, the conference committee for inviting uh, me to talk to you here this morning. So hopefully you can all, all see my screen clearly and, and hear me. So I head up the School of Simulation and Visualization at the Glasgow School of, School of Art. And I've been working professionally in computer graphics uh, since the mid 1990s. And in this, in this talk, I'm going to review the, so the evolution of computer graphics and the long anticipated coming of age of immersive technologies. And I will give you some real world examples and case studies of how SimViz, which is the School of Simulation and Visualization, how we use computer graphics to facilitate our understanding of complex real world problems. And that's in, in various, uh, various mediums from engineering to uh, heritage visualization, medical visualization, and a number of other e examples. So where are we based? We are in Glasgow, where we've just hosted the recent uh, COP26. So it's a wonderful city. I've, I've been here about 11, 11 years now. And what makes the School of Simulation and Visualization unique, I think, is it's the diverse community of different skill sets that all come together. So previously, when I worked in industry, uh, my background is computer science. So I was always surrounded by computer scientists or electronic engineers. And that, that means you have a very specific way of thinking. But when you start to put other disciplines in, it just means you start thinking outside the box a little bit more and, and people have different ways of solving problems. And it's just a much better way of, of, of approaching tasks and problems. So if we look at SimVis, for example, we're made up of 3D modelers, psychologists, computer programmers, sound engineers, and artists, all experimenting, exploring, and exploiting creative opportunities. So really fantastic place to work in the sense that you will have a, a psychologist sitting next to a computer programmer, sitting next to a 3D modeler. And as I said, I think this really helps with problem so solving and coming up with different approaches to, to problems. So just to give you an idea of our degree portfolio, because this is this kind of is important for, for later on in the discussion, because the research and the commercial work that we do feeds directly into our teaching. So we have postgraduate courses in sound for the moving image, which is a lot of the audio work. But then we have a, a master's degree in medical visualization and human anatomy, where students will for the first semester, they'll be learning about virtual reality, computer programming, 3D modeling. And in the second semester, they will do hands-on human dissection in the anatomy laboratories of Glasgow University. So students will understand the vocabulary and disciplines of both, uh, both sciences, if you like, of human anatomy and of the computer science. We have a degree in heritage visualization, games and virtual reality, and then we have some undergraduate programs in similar areas, plus, of course, PhD programs. So those subject areas are really the subject areas that I'm going to be talking to you about today and talking about some of the commercial and research projects that we do, which directly affects our, our teaching. So immersive systems. It seems to be everywhere now, even in the shops, you can start to see things like this with mannequins adorned with helmet mounted displays. I'm delighted to see that in Scotland, the, the government has started to invest by uh, providing uh, uh, helmet mounted displays for schools in, 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 and allowing students to walk along the Great Wall of China or go and walk on the moon or visit the depths of the ocean floor. And this technology is only getting better and better and better. But I like to step back in time a little bit, just to 
think about how far how far we've come in the last couple of decades. So let's have a little trip down memory lane. And I see memory lane every day because in my office, on my windowsill, I have all my early computers or my first computers. So if you look here, you've got Commodore plus four, ZX81, Spectrum 48K or Specky 48K, Atari ST, and here we have the Texas Instruments Speak and Maths. And I got all of these in the, in the 1980s. Speak and Maths was the first, well, actually it was Speak and Spell was the first fully integrated speech tip uh, by Texas Instruments in 1979, I think it was, uh, made famous, of course, by ET. So just looking at some of this technology, if you're just thinking about computer graphics and uh, companies like Atari, which was founded in 1972 by Nolan Bushnell, Thinking about first sort of computer games and computer graphics, some of you I'm sure will remember Pong and how we played Pong all the time. And look at the graphics here. And of course, this was driven through the Atari, which, which was released in 1977, sold about 30 million units. So Clyde Sinclair developed the, the ZX81 with just 1K of memory, and you had to assemble it yourself or you could buy it uh, pre-assembled of course for a little bit more money but imagine having to build your own computer today from scratch i mentioned sir, sir clive sinclair because he he passed away he died just a few months ago actually and uh, he was a very important person for me but also for thousands of young people in the 1980s growing up because he helped provide home computers, he, he, he got computers into the home. Let's look at computer graphics from that, from that era. This was a scary monster from the 1980s. Yeah. Computer graphics have been improving phenomenally, and this is something we'll, we'll, we shall look at. But this, is, this is the graphics of the day. And in fact, early computer games didn't even have any graphics, it was just text or adventure games, and you had to type everything. The old BBC microcomputer sold quite a number of units because they managed to get into the schools and colleges in the UK, and the ZX Spectrum 48K, which obviously had a bit more colour. And of course, we had to load everything in from tape, which was very frustrating if you had been waiting for 10 minutes and you got to the end and then there was an error and you had to start everything again. But we'll revisit this shortly and the computer graphics that was uh, of that era but i want to talk to you really about immersive computer graphics and immersive environments and a lot of people think of virtual reality as being a new thing or immersive environments as being a new thing but it's not you know if you if you if you think that uh, uh simulating or, or fooling the brain into thinking that you're somewhere else, as we do in virtual environments, then, you know, these early panoramic paintings of the 19th century are early types of virtual reality. And these paintings would surround you. So these paintings would come all the way around you and you could look around and it would almost feel that you were, you were there. So these were massive artworks that were generally sort of landscape or military battle or historical events. And they became very popular, as I said, in the 19th century. Thinking of stereo, stereoscopic visualization and viewing something in 3D. Again, that's not a new concept. And in fact, if you look back at the old uh, stereoscopic experiences uh, in the 1860s, you had these wonderful stereoscopic displays and they re these, these devices, before the moving picture, were the equivalent of the Xbox. And you have, obviously, you have a stereoscopic uh, photograph. So you have a left eye image and a right eye image. And then you put them into the display and you can focus it with your left hand. This is, I collect these actually. So this is my Parisian viewer. And uh, the picture that my colleague Matthew is looking at here is actually I can remember what this one is. This is the Alaskan Gold Rush. So 
incredible pictures and uh, captured in stereo and it's very high quality 3d it's very high quality stereo and just just to be clear this bit of wood here is is forcing your right eye to see the right eye image and your left eye to see the left eye image and they were captured simultaneously with special cameras like this in the 1950s people were experimenting like Morton Heilig were experiment, experimenting with devices such as the Sensorama. It never made any money. I don't think, I don't think it was successful at all, but it enabled you to experience in, virtu in a virtual environment, riding a motorbike down the streets of Brooklyn and the handlebars would be shaking and it would be blowing uh, smells into your face and you could see in 3D. But that wasn't really truly interactive. And then the real pioneers just turn the audio off here. Real pioneers with people like Ivan Sutherland, who this is his part of his PhD thesis, which was called Sketchpad, which is Ivan was a real pioneer in, in computer aided design, but he also went on to develop some of the early helmet mounted displays. And he was a real visionary, this gentleman was able to really understand where technology was and, and discussing things like virtual reality, etc. So this is, yeah, as I said, this is a sketchpad, which is part of his PhD thesis and early concepts in, in CAD. So this is jumping back to that ZX81 image from 1981. This is a scary monster in 1981. And this is a scary monster in 2014. This is real time computer graphics. So this isn't pre rendered. This is this is the actual graphics that you'll see in the grain in the game. And this is from 2014. So this is still a while ago. But you can see the difference and the, the improvements that we've made. We're now obviously in 3D. We're doing we've got billions of colors instead of just black or white. We've billions of colors. We can do real time ray tracing and photorealistic rendering. And this whole improvement in computer graphics has been driven by the games industry. It's the games industry that has brought down the, the cost of computers, computer graphics and, and graphics cards. Unfortunately, it's all gone back up again because everyone's using computer graphics cards for bit mining and Bitcoin. But certainly the, the reason that we've really seen massive improvements in computer graphics is, be, is because of the huge demands from the games industry. So again, with, with helmet mounted displays, if you look on the left, you've got Ivan Sutherland's early helmet mounted display from the 60s. And then on the right, you've got the new Valve Index. It's not too, it's not too new now, uh, but you know, very, very high quality. Um, so I think it's something like 1440 times 1600 pixels per eye. Good refresh rate, extremely immersive. And very cheap, you know, I studied compute, I studied virtual reality in the 1990s. And for a helmet mounted display, we were talking tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds. And it didn't work. Computer graphics wasn't done on a PC on a Windows PC. It was all done on silicon graphics computers, which again, cost thousands and thousands of pounds. So it's, it, we're now able to do this, this valve index will cost about a thousand pounds. A good computer graphics machine will cost maybe two or 3000 pounds. So it's significantly cheaper than where we used to be. And Ivan Sutherland's uh, early helmet mounted display, as I said before, he was a, a real pioneer in the field of virtual reality. And he wrote a wonderful paper. I think it was 1967 from memory and it was called the ultimate display. And in that he talks about, the ultimate display is one where a chair is good enough to sit in and handcuffs displayed in such a room will be confining and a bullet displayed in such a room will be fatal. And he then went on to say this would be the wonderland into which Alice walked. So a real pioneer within virtual reality really understood uh, where the technology was potentially going to go. But VR, of course, you know, and I could spend hours talking about the history of this it's not all been plain sailing and we're not going to i'm not going to dwell on this but there's been a lot of what i would call false starts in virtual reality where we haven't managed to you know everyone's tried to jump on the the virtual reality bandwagon or the immersive environments bandwagon and it's been a complete flop it's been a disaster it's been a disaster because the technology 
wasn't ready. All this, all the virtual boy did, which was a, a very early helmet mounted display, uh, was in, in 1995 or 1996, I think this came out. All it did was give everybody a headache. And it was just one color, red, using red LEDs, because red LEDs are the cheapest LEDs you can get. And of course, as I said, on the right, you've got the valve index, which is incredible HMD today. So just touching on this Gartner hype cycle. So this enables us to see where technologies are, um, where new technologies are. And I, I bought this 2019 one up because it's interesting because virtual reality and augmented reality are no longer considered to be emerging technologies. So this, this company, I don't know if you haven't, if you're not aware of these, Gartner basically put new products in one of these uh, locations, either an innovation trigger, a peak of inflated expectations, trough of disillusionment, slope of enlightenment, or plateau of productivity. And for a long time, virtual reality and augmented reality were, were on this emerging um, hype cycle, it's called. Um, but from 2019, they, they've, they've managed to move, move off. Right, so let's talk about some, some case studies and I can give you some real world examples of some of the work that we're doing using this state of the art technology. So the first area I'm gonna to touch on is pharmaceutical training. So we work very closely with Strathclyde University, which is also based in Glasgow. And we've got a large research project with them called Articula, which is artificial intelligence for integrated ICT enabled pharmaceutical manufacturing. And what you've got here is an image from Strathclyde Pharmaceuticals strategic document for the next five years. So this is where they see themselves working in the next five years. If I just zoom in on part of the laboratory here, we can see that they, they're using sort of augmented reality with these glasses and they can see some equipment that's in on display that doesn't obviously exist. And they're able to interact and interface with it. So what have we been doing with this company? Well, a lot of the equipment is extremely complicated to use and set up. So here we've got uh, something called an EasyMax mixer, which is in the laboratory. The probes that uh, Cameron is holding here are extremely expensive, they're thousands of pounds. And we need to train students how to use these. So rather than there being a, a big bottleneck in, in knowing how to, uh, how to use these, uh, this equipment, because you've got to teach them using the real equipment or watching a video, we've managed to create, so this is now computer graphics, we've managed to create a virtual reality laboratory. And now I've got all this equipment we've built into virtual reality. So that's the same equipment but now I can put on a helmet mounted display and I can teach students how to disassemble and reassemble this equipment for a specific experiment. All right, so now students can, can use virtual reality. It means we can have multiple people going through the equipment. We're not gonna stop the equipment being used for experiments because we can train in VR. We've got lots of visual cues that we can use. You can actually look down and under the machine and look through windows in the machine. And we're currently doing a lot of experiments with this new system at the moment, but the early data is suggesting that it's extremely effective and much better than traditional methods of teaching. The next step is to open the clamp chain, touch it and click the trigger. Wait till it's open and then you'll be able to remove it. Please be- There we go, so I'm just jump forward as well and you can see So then they have to reassemble it. And you can just look through the window here. Let's just see if... Okay, and then I think they're gonna look down. There we go. That's what I wanted to show you. So you can actually look down through the windows in, in the virtual environment. So it's a very uh, effective method of learning. Medical visualization, again, an area that we work very closely in. We've been developing a very accurate model of the human body for probably about a decade now. 
And this is what we call the definitive human, and we use it within our teaching. Rather than going through so many two-dimensional photographs in, in textbooks, what we're able to do is to create tools in virtual reality and in just standard um, computer software where we can teach dentists how to give anesthetics and injections and locations where to do that. We've also developed, as I said, a, an accurate model of the human body so we can train people all the different terminology and, and locations because it's extremely complex, the human body, especially the head and neck where we've really focused a lot of our attention. So we've, we've managed to do this through CT, MRI scans, through cadaveric dissection, and very talented computer modelers working together. If we look at this graphic here on the left, you can see the, sim, uh, the skull that we've created. In the middle is a, is, a, is a reference skull and a real skull on the right. So you can see here how accurate our, our model is. And of course, you can be inside it. So I'll just show you this, where you can put on a helmet mounted display and immersive technology and actually fully interact with the, the model. I'll just jump forward and you can see Stefania here. It's just taking a bone out of the uh, out of the body. And then another thing she can do is she can grab a light and hold the light over to, to get more information about what she's looking at. I'll just jump forward again. She can stand inside and walk around it. Okay, because we work in 3D, that's how the brain works. So when you've got very complex anatomy like the, the head and neck, it's, it's, it's wonderful for us to be able to, to interface with it in this manner. We've also done a lot of work with, with various cancers. For example, this is cancer of the tongue. And with every revolution, we can teach our students about what to look out for. Every time you go to the dentist, you put your tongue out. This is the reason why, so that the dentist can, can check that you've not got any abscesses growing or elements growing on the tongue. So here you can just see, as it spins round now, we'll see that it is growing. There you go. So we've got special software that we've developed, which uh, is available to all of our students where we can drill down into, into the data sets. This is a really exciting project that we're working on at the moment. And this, what you're looking at here is a MRI leaflet for, for parents who, whose children are about to have an MRI scan. And as you can see, it's, it's a very poor quality. It's a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. And it's become illegible now. You can't even read what it says. It actually says MRI scan at the top. And working with the NHS and immersive technologies, we've developed uh, new sort of augmented reality patient leaflets that you, uh, you hold your, your phone or your tablet device over the leaflet and the leaflet will come to life. So this is a patient information leaflet for parents whose children are going to have cleft lip surgery and the leaflet comes alive and explains to the parents the process that is going to take place with their child. And it's significantly better than what was provided previously. So this is an exciting area that we're, that we're currently working on. And we've, we've published quite a lot of work in this area and it's proving to be extremely effective. Jumping forward again, so this is actually, this is actually quite old work now, but this is work I did in uh, virtual reality training for dangerous sports. So this is paragliding simulator, which I think was, we did in around 2005. So virtual reality was no way near as good as it is now, but it was still sufficient to be able to build a, a good simulator to teach people how to fly uh, paragliders safely. And of course, it's extremely important when, you, when you're developing software for, you know, activities such as this, that you're training them correctly. Because if, you, if you're training them incorrectly, a procedure incorrectly, and it goes into their ingrained user model, 
So they keep doing that method and you're teaching them the wrong thing when they come to do it in real life, it could be fatal. So it's absolutely imperative that you that that's done correctly. Heritage visualization, again, we do a lot of heritage work. I showed you earlier that we've got a degree in heritage visualization where we teach students how to do, for example, laser scanning and 3D modeling. I've got a couple of examples here for you. So this is the Isle of Staffa or Fingal's Cave, which is absolutely stunning um, cave and island in the Inner Hebrides of Scotland, just up, up here. And it's absolutely beautiful rock formations. And this is, this is actually inside the cave and a lot of tourists come here to, to view it. And my colleague, uh, Dr. Stuart Jeffrey, and some of his colleagues have created a very accurate model of the cave and the island. And here I've got a, just kill the sound. Okay, so here you've got an interactive uh, boat ride to the cave. And the cave is all modeled accurately. It was all done through laser scanning. And this is actually interactive as well on YouTube. So I can actually move my camera and viewpoint around and I can actually go right in, inside the cave. So I'll just jump forward a little bit. So you can see, here we go. Now I've, I've experienced this virtual reality experience many times, but interestingly for the first time, I actually uh, went to the cave myself. Just, there we go. So it's my son and uh, a few years ago, obviously during COVID time, because Jacob's got a mask on there. Uh, I went to the cave and Fingal's cave in real life. And it was a really quite odd experience because I kind of knew what I was going to experience. And this is us coming in. And this is me just going into the cave, but I actually already knew exactly what I was going to experience as I walked around that corner into the cave because I'd seen it and experienced it in, in a good high quality virtual reality. Again, some of you will be aware that we lost the beautiful Macintosh building to a fire at the Glasgow School of Art, but we were able to, we did have a number of 3D models and laser scans of the building. So this is a project that Stephen, uh, Dr. Professor Stephen uh, Love has been working on, where we're sharing experiences or, or interactions within the, the late Macintosh building. So you can actually walk around it. And we've also got a lot of the furniture captured in, in 3D as well. And this is the, the building now. So this is after the, the second fire, because we had two fires there. So this is all laser scanned uh, data. And this is what we'll be teaching our students to do as well, is how to use laser scans to laser scanners to accurately model and, and capture buildings. So here is another scan. So this here is the Macintosh. This is after the first fire. And it takes a long time because you have to go around every single room with the laser scanner, scan it in, captures also, also captures photographic information. But it was is really, truly beautiful data. It's just point clouds. It looks like it's a solid object, but that's just because of the density of the points. But it's like a doll's house. It's like you've, uh, uh, you've cut through a doll's house. And I can actually just zoom in a bit here. And you can see, you can actually read the signs if I, if I zoom in close enough. But this is a accurate model of the the building, which, which no longer exists anymore. So it's a wonderful uh, heritage data set that we've got, that we've, we've, we've managed to capture. And we're currently working on how we're going to recreate this actually in, in, in true 3D. I've recently, I published about, I think it was three or four years ago, a book that's just on, it's called The Art of the Point Cloud. 
and it's a collection of point clouds from all over the world that had submissions from all over the world and it's just of laser scan data so it's 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 all sorts of bizarre things that have been scanned in in lasers uh, using using laser scanners so it's a raw point cloud data set and truly beautiful pieces of, of art so so yes let's have a look at some engineering and the importance of virtual reality and immersive environments for for engineering so what i've got here is an animation of a commercial project that we had and it was to do with a nuclear power station that was being decommissioned it was the hunterston power station and as part of the decommissioning process, the, the building loses all its power. So they have no power at all, which means there's no lights in the building other than what the, the, the engineers will, will take into the building themselves. So what we're able to do is do a laser scan of the building in order to create an accurate model using 3D modelers so that we'll, we'll scan the building in, we'll take that point cloud data set, we'll then scan, scan that, scan that uh, data in, turn the data points into polygons and 3D geometry, and then we'll use that 3D geometry to create what you're seeing here, which is a, a 3D model. So once you've got that information, you can then do other lighting calculations and, and simulate other um, sort of scenarios. So for example, what we can do is we can teach engineers, what's it going to be like when you open the door and walk in? What, what's it going to be like? What are you actually going to experience? Because it's going to be very strange for them when, they, when they're walking in, it's pitch black. So we can simulate that in the, the virtual environment. So I'll just run that. Okay, so that's the power station, which has been created. And now we can zoom in Okay, so now we can see as uh, one of our developers looking around. And you can literally look over the balconies. So I said earlier about uh, games technology. So let me just uh, let me just pause this here. This is all you. This all this development here is all using games technology and games engines, which are used to develop games. Which of course has a there's a massive demand for that. And these concepts can be used for real world applications, which is which is what we're looking at here. So what I'm saying here is just because you just because you do a, a, a degree in games programming doesn't mean to say that you're just going to be you're just having to develop computer games. Right. This is the, the, the world is your oyster here. So many companies are realizing the power and potential of gaming technologies. And this is interesting as well. So what was happening there is this this person is looking at a virtual iPad, which, of course, doesn't exist. And the, the iPad is, it enables him to actually interface with the 3D scene and interface with the, with the model.